Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo bros we're back with the yo elliot show and today i got a guest that's going to be talking about using porn and why you should overcome it and the reason why i brought our guest on is because every week i speak to upwards to 30 40 men who are thinking about joining my war on vice and it i've discovered that more than half struggle with pornography and those who are coming in for weed or drinking, they're probably jerking off on the side too. So I'm seeing that it is probably the main problem, the main stumbling block, the main ball and chain that is holding men back from being their strongest selves today. And so I'm so blessed to have met Mark Quipet, who is an expert in helping men be their strongest selves, but he has some experience with overcoming pornography use, PMO, uh, and he helps men do the same. So, Mark, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, man, it's a pleasure, dude. Right, well, no, no, yeah, thank, thank, yeah, thanks for being here on your show. Thank you for having me as well. Oh, I <laughs> thought you were say. saying thank me for being on Earth. <laughs> oh well, you know, I'm very grateful for that too. I remember uh, back in the. Uh, the day your strength camp videos were like that was like OG like male improvement for like the modern age. So I'm grateful for that as well. Yeah, you and I had a pretty cool conversation before we hit the uh, the record button, and you know you asked me about that, and really it's it was a first part of a grand strategy to ultimately make men strong in mind, body, and soul. So starting with the body is a great place. Um, today it, we're still working with overcoming the body, but more like the sins of the flesh, right? There's one thing yeah. to try to aim for climbing the mountain, but if you got a ball and chain attached to your ankle, you ain't going too far. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on why it seems that men today are struggling so much with this vice of pornography use. Ooh, there's a few reasons for it, but I think probably the biggest is just that it's a freakishly weird problem. All right. Like porn, porn use is like, like when you, once you get hooked on it and most guys, if you, you know, have never stopped using it, you're hooked on it. Okay. Like most guys don't think they're hooked on it. Oh, I use it a normal amount. Well, it's like right. try and stop and see what happens. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the reason why is that it, it's so strange. Like the drug dealer, you know, it sits in everybody's pocket. OK, and because of that, there's no real barrier to access. It's totally free. Like it, it hit me the other day. It's like to, to try and create an analogy to help people understand it. It's like imagine if you were a cocaine addict. All right. And the issue was that every single time you got down, uh, you, you sat down, you opened up your computer or you turned on the TV or you just walked by an attractive person on the street little puffs of cocaine were blown into your face. Okay. Every single time you, you took out your phone, just poof, little, little puff of cocaine. 
Okay. And then all you have to do is like lazily wiggle your thumbs on this little box. And then you have an infinite supply of totally free cocaine. All right. Try, try quitting cocaine in that environment. It'd be basically impossible. You know, at least with our, our normal understanding or the, the modern society's normal understanding of how like habit change works. So that's why, that's why people are hooked is because, you know, the, the addictive machinery and part of it's just, it's built inside of you. And then sexual or hypersexualized society is always throwing it in your face and, you know, it can make you feel good. And that's, that's why all the people get hooked on all addictions. It's that, that immediate feel good button. So when life gets hard, this is the easiest one to press for most guys. Yeah. You're mentioning how easily acceptable, accessible and acceptable it seems, but accessible yeah. it is. I remember growing up, you know, I'm a bit older than most of the guys I mentor. And so I was pre-internet age. And uh, in order to get pornography, we needed to like raid somebody's dad's cabinet or, uh, you know, somebody walks out of the drugstore with a Playboy under their shirt. You know what I'm saying? Like we had to like right. find it or steal it or somehow uh, uncover the treasure somewhere where what I hear you saying, which is so damn evident. And I guess uh, really a modern day epidemic of sorts is just how easily and ever present and omnipresent pornography is. Right. It is. And it's it's a weird kind of thing, too, because we have obviously like a, a heroin epidemic, like a fentanyl epidemic. And the consequences of that are acute, serious, massive death. Like, you know, I, I keep hearing like fentanyl is like the number one killer between for people ages like, you know, was it 15 through 40 or something like that? Wow. Porn's not going to kill you. You know, generally, you know, I'm sure there's some extreme cases, but <laughs> you, it's not going to kill you. And so because of that, it's a problem that sort of um, floats under the radar. But the consequences are still massively felt in society. I think that like a massive like a, a huge percentage of our divorce rates are mm -hmm. could be linked in some way to a pornography. I think that the general underperformance of men compared to women in a lot of ways can be linked to pornography and to some extent, maybe even video games, but like the general malaise you see in the average male population today, they don't have any, most of them don't have any fire in them. They don't have any drive. They don't have any ability to really get themselves together. And, um, I think it's because they're shooting all their energy into this. They're wrecking their brain, their dopaminergic motivational system. And it's just, uh, it's messing them up on a really deep level. Wow. You know, uh, I remember seeing years ago, like they would make fun of Catholics and they'd make fun of like, oh, you know, the old traditional ways where they'd say, if you're playing with yourself, you'd go blind. I remember seeing a picture of like a really right. languished looking man laying on the couch who was like, a, 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 he was a victim of self abuse, they, they would call it, right? And it, right. and you know, they really tried to drum it into our, our brains, into our hearts that um, this, this is sinful. And so, you know, in our right. post-Christian age, when you hear somebody say sinful, they're like, oh, well, that's just your opinion. Um, that's between you and your make-believe God. But there's good reason why these things are seen as uh, antithesis to our well-being. What are some of those, you know, very biological, physiological, psychological detriments to the use of pornography? Sure. So, I mean... One of the biggest ones is just the amount of dopamine that it releases. So it's kind of like a, a neurochemi neurochemical nuke. You know, when you open up porn and you masturbate to it, like your brain is releasing so much dopamine. And so dopamine is the neurotransmitter for anticipation, for motivation. And so like when you're constantly bombarding your brain with that, um, it overstimulates you. It's kind of like if you, you know, stare at a really bright light then and you walk into like a normal room, just walk inside. Like if you stare at the sun, you walk inside, you're not gonna be able to see really well. Well, on the motivational level, if you're like, you know, overstimulating yourself with porn, then other more natural rewards stop registering. So, you know, simple shit like doing the dishes or, um, you know, uh, like getting your work done or hanging out with friends, all that stuff stops seeming so interesting. Hmm. And because of that, you're, you know, enjoyment you get out of just normal everyday life goes down significantly. And then when you, normal life doesn't feel as good, you want to get that that kick again. You know, you want to get that, feel that excitement. And so you go back to porn. So motivation is one of the big things that gets screwed up from it.
Um, additionally, you can get some pretty serious sexual dysfunction. Uh, there's like when you, your brain gets good at what it practices. So uh, neuroplasticity, they call it. And so if you're constantly training your brain to think that um, sexual activity is something that happens with a, you know, a cell phone and some hand lotion mm. or computer screen or whatever, then your brain starts to think, oh, this is what sex is. But then when you go to have real sex with an actual person, uh, all of a sudden your equipment doesn't work right. You know, we have, I think it was something like the percentage of teenagers that had erectile dysfunction in like 1900s or whatever was like less than 1%. And then it steadily increased like with a massive spike, you know, uh, or went up a little bit more in the 60s and 70s and then a massive spike internet age. And now it's something like uh, 15 to 20% of like teenagers have erectile dysfunction, which is something that like should never happen. Like ever, even in your 20s and 30s. I mean, like, come on, you should you shouldn't be having trouble getting it up. You should have I don't know, you would think that you'd have more trouble keeping it down, at, you know, especially when you're a teenager. But like, no, guys are um, they're having trouble performing sexually and you can lead to all these kinds of like crazy fetishes and stuff like that. And I can get into that if you want, because some of that gets a little out there. But if you're hooked on some stuff that you don't like, you don't really feel good about. A lot of that's because of the way that porn affects your brain it ex the, the excitement mechanism combined with the, like the arousal mechanism, like all this kind of stuff happens where you can get some troubling fetishes. Um, and then like, I guess those are, those are like the big biological ones. Um, but then I would say probably on like a, what do you want to call it? This is probably biological too. I don't fully understand all the mechanisms, but like, conceptually, this is how I understand it, is that it removes your uh, ability to strive like for levels of competence and status, because not only does it release a lot of um, dopamine when you use porn, I believe it also creates kind of like an artificial status scenario, mm -hmm. like junk status. Yeah. And so you're it's simulating this environment where you're this high status alpha male like on a primal level getting to have sex with an infinite harem of women it's like you're you're like this old testament king solomon or whatever right. um and so it, it, when you have that your natural drive as a man to go out make something more of yourself acquire status and competence in the world so that you can be a good man in your in your community and attract a good woman that starts getting holes shot in it and so I think a lot of guys who are having trouble like really getting their life together, it's because, you know, they don't they don't have that that primal drive anymore because they're 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 stuffing that that appetite for accomplishment with status. It's like they're 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 tricking their brain into thinking that they're already successful. So if you're already successful, why would your brain let you change anything? It's like, dude, we're having sex with an infinite harem of women. Don't change anything. We've hit the genetic jackpot. So yeah. it's not going to give you any money or money and not going to give you any resources, neurochemical resources to change. Yeah. You know, that makes me think about the organ itself, right? Like the penis is a seeking organism organ. It fills up with power and it seeks a place to finally rest. And so right. as a man, we are naturally inclined to being seeking people. We're, we're, we're seekers. We seek adventure. We seek conquest. We seek building, growing, doing, right? And this is, this is the extroverted nature of the organ that rises up and reaches out where right. th the opposite of that is the vagina, which is passive, which is a receiver, which is open to having something seek and deploy towards it. I don't know if I'm using the right language, but you see what right. I'm saying? <laughs> I once remember, re I remember reading a book because, you know, this idea of pornography is big and I want to talk about it, but I think just by mere virtue of constantly, constantly blowing our loads as men, uh, either be th through sterile sex with our wives or girlfriends or the use of pornography, um, both, both, I think, sort of sap us of something. But I remember reading this book about Carezza sex, which is basically to have mm -hmm. sex in your marriage, but without blowing your load. And the author goes on to propose that, um, that well, that's a, that's a, it's a great way to maintain your vitality. But right. he said something that in was, that book. Was that Marnia Robinson's book? Uh, Brother Moore. Cupid's Poor. Oh, okay. Brother Moore's, and I, I, I emailed him not too long ago. I want to get him on the show. But he said something in that 
in that uh, in the book that is that you reminded me of when you talked about that lack of drive that men experience after, you know, PMO. Uh, he said the penis is an active organ and should never be treated passively. And so that means like anything like where you're laying down and it's being taken care of. He, he proposes that mm -hmm. blowjobs are passive too. He's like, the penis should never, be act should never be passive. You should never be laying there and having something done to it. A penis is, de is designed to raise up and do something out there. <laughs> anyway, so just That's sort of a, a wild concept that I thought of uh, while you were speaking about how it makes men lay back. And then there's this so false sense of pride for blowing your load and not even actively actually seeking uh, somewhere to deploy. Right. And I think something that happens when you are regularly masturbating using porn, etc., is that it trains you to be unable to hold your sexual charge as a man. Right. And so like your sexual charge as a man, like it's naturally designed to be able to be transmuted. Like you think about it, you think about our hunter gatherer ancestors, you got a, a young guy, all right, you know, post puberty, he's horny, but he doesn't have enough status in the village yet to get, you know, a, a, a woman. Okay, maybe the, the the village isn't in good enough state. Everyone's like in a survival mode or whatever. It's like not really the it's it's, it's hard to woo the ladies. Okay, whatever the situation, mm -hmm. but like that sexual desire, what is that? What does that guy? What does it drive that guy to do? It drives him to well, rise up. You know, make the village a better place. Be a strong man. Be a competent man. Be a leader. Be someone that the women would want to be with. Right. So, status acquisition is the natural expression of, you know, uh, I guess, retained sexual energy. It's like, it, it just goes from one to the other. And so when you don't have any ability to hold your sexual charge, because most guys don't, they've, they've been masturbating for a long time. And it's like, as soon as that sexual charge builds up, they're like, oh, I just gotta get it out of me. I just, just gotta, you know, right. get rid of the demon or whatever it is. It's like, no, you're just weak. It's just kind of like if someone put, you know, uh, 185 pounds on your back for you know in a squat rack if you never lifted before it's gonna be like ow ow the bar hurts ah and you like you got to get out from underneath it right huh. but once you develop that internal strength that that it's not it's not musculature but it's like uh you know some kind of neuro neurological conditioning of some level you know of your organs yeah, and also virtue. of like you know, you know i mean fortitude you know, yeah. and vigilance right Right. And so once you build that, all of a sudden you realize that your sexual energy is a very, very potent source of power that if you can learn how to wield it well, then it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like adding some rocket fuel to your days. Yeah, that's really great because a lot of guys just make it out to be that it's something that they must do, like taking a dump or sneezing. Like, <laughs> like you know, they, there's absolutely no, you know, because the sneeze starts coming, you have no control over it. But what right. I hear you saying is that not only can you have control over it, you don't have to blow your load, but there are a myriad of benefits that are associated with retaining. Is that right? Yes. And I'm not like one of the uh, the semen retention kind of purists um, and whatnot. Like I, I mean, like, you know, if you are having sex a lot, then obviously that's going to take some energy out of you. But if you're like a married guy and you've got an active sex life, is that really draining you a huge amount? I, I don't know. I don't think so necessarily. I mean, you can look at a lot of incredibly successful people with, who put out insane levels of activity and whatnot, who were apparently like, you know, total horn dogs, you know, just go read the biographies of, of you know, great men or whatever. Um, so I don't know if I fully buy that. But I think on a um, spiritual level, like what you are driven to do, specifically, um, and the character and the way you hold yourself while you do it, that's something that um, is very much strengthened through learning how to hold your sexual charge. Because what you're, you're learning how to do is turn a sensation of deprivation into a sensation of anticipation. And like when you can get some control mm. over that switch, you, that's, that's an absurd power to have. Wow, so that's sort of a, a mind switch, right? Like a paradigm to see it from where guys are thinking uh, that I deserve this, I need to do this, I'm not, I'm not getting what I need right. to uh, anticipation, meaning like I get to uh, hold this charge for potential. It's like I get, to, I get to make love to life. 
Mm. That's what it is. It's like it's like learning how to see reality as like the womb that you are going to impregnate with your will. And so like that's that's like what sexual transmutation is. And you can feel that like if you like if you're if you know how to properly transmute a sexual like craving, like say you're in the gym. OK. And you see some hot girls and they're like, oh, if you go into lust mode. OK. Um, and, and you just like try to fight against that. OK. You're just like, no, don't don't look. Blah, blah, blah. That's going to exhaust you. OK. If you just give into it, then you're just going to be, you know, sucked up into that spirit of lust. You're not going to be able to focus. You're going to be being creepy and not who you want to be. But if you can learn how to take that energy, be like, you know what? No, she doesn't get that energy. She doesn't deserve this right. energy. OK. This is my energy. How do I want to express this charge that I've just found inside of myself? Well, I'm going to be the man that I want to be. And then you're going to be able to, you're going to control your eyes. You're going to crush your workout. You're going to feel like a million bucks. It's going to like, you're going to, your energy is going to go because you're going to feel powerful. You're going to feel in control. And so that's what we want to like move toward is this, this ability where you are the master of your energy. Cause if you're, if, and if you're a lustful guy, then you're not the master of your energy. Any, you know, nice pair of boobs walking by is. And so it's right. like, I don't know how you can claim that a lustful frame is somehow like dominant or masculine. I think it's, it's, you've said it to me before. It's like, that's, you know, lust is, is a weak frame. It's effeminate. It's, it's pleasure seeking rather than, you know, fulfillment seeking. Yeah. So one of the paradigms that pervades our culture is this sense of pride that's associated with having lots of puss. Like, uh, like a, it's a man's uh, right. It's his prerogative to be chasing tail all day long. And if you're not, if you're not blowing your load with girls, well, then at least you can get the cheap substitute. Um, oh boy, I forgot where I was going to go with that. Huh. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you're right. You're right. You know, that's definitely what happened. Like guys, like they have this notch count idea, this idea that you know, casual sex, that's the thing. Oh, I remember. You're not Sorry, it, you're missing out. Let me let me go with it. Uh, I was thinking about thinking grow rich. Yeah. So sure. the first place that we hear that term, uh, sexual transmutation, I think mostly in the West, most men uh, is from uh, uh, Napoleon Hill wrote thinking right. grow rich. And I, you know, it wasn't until much later in my life that I reread it again. And I understood what he was saying in terms of why most men don't reach their real successful, successful potential until their 50s. And he asserts in there that it's, well, that's when they stop chasing tail. That's when they stop trying to have sex. That's when, like, maybe their wives are done. And you know what? And rather than feeling deprived, like, oh, well, my wife doesn't want to have sex anymore. And I got this boner. I need to go and maybe cheat on her. Or maybe I should have a, uh, a, a, a an affair or another woman. Or, or I need to be using pornography. It was like time to double down on your business. It was like time to double down yeah. on doing great things in the world rather than feeling this sense of neediness or deprivation because you're not having sex anymore. I like to say, blessed is the man that doesn't need to blow his load. <laughs> yes, that's the key. It's like if you don't need to, then that's that's a a power that you have. But we're reaching a point where like, OK, that used to happen naturally, you know, later in life for a lot of men. It doesn't have to happen today, especially because of porn and porn culture. It's like, you know, guys can can and are getting hooked on this till very late in life. You know, I've worked with guys who are in their 70s um, still dealing with this problem. But that's why like quitting porn is something that you got to view as like a rite of passage. Mm. I think I think quitting porn is the rite of passage for the modern man, because until you do that, um, you know, you're not really in control of yourself. You're not in control of like your most fundamental essence as a man, your sexual energy. And so learning how to do that, learning how to master your sexuality by, you know, quitting pornography, stopping jerking off, uh, that puts you in a position then like where mastering anything else, it's really not that big of a deal comparatively. I'm like, I'm not saying that things won't be hard anymore, but it's rare that you're going to find a problem that's going to uh, be as subtle and difficult as quitting porn is. And it's right there and available to you. You know, I think a lot of times we have these yeah. grand plans and ideas about building virtue and being great men, but like Jordan Peterson says, make your bed, right? Like <laughs> not right. jerking off is like making your bed. It's like, dude, don't try to build grand castles in the sky you have no self-control why not start right. there absolutely 
So like with that kind of thing, it's like, yeah, start here. Start with this thing. It's right in front of you. And for many of you guys, like if you don't know if, if you've got a problem or not, just try and quit for a week. Mm-hmm. Try and quit for two weeks. You know, see what happens. And <laughs> what might happen at first is kind of what happened to me. Like back when I was uh, like when I quit, like I had started masturbating and using porn when I was like around 12, 13. And then when I was like 15, you know, I was a good little Catholic boy going to Catholic school and like the guilt would eat me up, you know, like a good old Catholic guilt. Right. And it was good. Lent. And I said, all right, I'm going to I'm going to give up jerking off and looking at porn this month uh, for 40 days. And I remember like 30 days in, I felt like I was dying. I was like <laughs> depressed. I was like irritable. I was just getting upset. I was emotional. I was just like all over the place. And I was just like, screw it. And I just went and I jerked off. And I remember like the feeling I had afterward was amazing. It felt so good. I actually started cracking up. And at that point, I I realized, oh, oh my gosh, these Catholics, they're crazy. They've got it all (laughs) wrong when it comes to sexuality. They've got it all wrong. And so at that point, I kind of stopped following Catholic sexual teaching. Um, What I realized later after my porn addiction almost like completely like crippled my ability to be productive, like in any sense of the word, and I finally quit, I realized, okay, what I was going through back then was actually withdrawal. (laughs) I was going through withdrawal. And uh, that's what you got to watch out for. So you try and cut out some porn, you start feeling horrible. Well, that's withdrawal. That's not your body saying you need porn. Mm. That's your body saying, hey, I'm detoxing from like this, you know, addictive substance. That's a really good way of looking at it because I could just imagine guys saying, why am I making myself miserable? Why am I trying to put myself through this? And then the cope is so strong, right? Like uh, it's normal, it's natural. You know, uh, science says that I evolved from bonobos and so I need to blow my load. (laughs) Hey, so uh, that would be great to hear, man, like because before this conversation uh, began recording, you know, we were talking about how there are so few genuine coaches out there to support men in this way, mainly because not many have either been challenged with it. And I got to be completely transparent. It was never an issue for me, Um, but I see everybody struggling and I want to help. Uh, But then on the other hand, there's guys who know it's a bad idea, but they haven't overcome it themselves. You, on the other hand, have faced the dragon and slayed him. Tell us a little bit about you know your journey of uh, of, of discovering that it needs to be something that you gain mastery over, and how you how you went about doing it. Sure. So, I've been I guess I quit about ten years ago now because it was in twenty it was in uh, yeah twenty thirteen is when I quit. How old are you? And I was. Uh, I'm 33. So you were, you were 23. Okay, cool. Yeah, about the yeah. same time yeah. that most guys struggle. Yeah, and so I had just um, gotten out of college with a software engineering degree. I was living with my uh, my girlfriend who I'd started dating freshman year of college. Um, I was living with her parents um, while, and I was I was working a software engineering job. So we were all all there, and um, I hated it. I, I was never very good at software engineering um, and the job just felt like it was sucking the soul out of me. But I had always been like really obsessed with personal development. It was kind of it was kind of weird. Like back when I was 14, I had a girlfriend I was crazy about and she was like a year older than me and she went to high school and she dumped me. And at that moment, I like cried for like five minutes and then I just repressed and two things happened. I became like obsessed with self-development because I never wanted, I wanted to be so good that no one could ever dump me again. And I started reading like psycho cybernetics and think and grow rich and all this kind of stuff. But then I also like developed a porn addiction to keep the feeling stuff down and a, and a video game addiction on top of it. So like those two things like self-development and like ad- addict, they were like kind of neck and neck through high school with the self-development side, more or less winning. I had a you know pretty good time in high school. But then once I got to college, things like the wheels started coming off, um, especially when you throw partying in there uh, and all that kind of stuff uh, and not being happy about my path. So back to when I was 24 living with uh, like doing the software engineering job, I was like, shoot, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm quitting and I'm going to become a life coach, which is honestly hilarious looking back at it because I was a 23 year old who had no real life experience was addicted to porn and video games uh, and I wanted to be a life coach Uh, but self-development was like the thing I was most passionate about and so 
I started this training certification to become a life coach and it was good training and everything like that. But like, man, I could not get myself to work on the business. Like it's not, you, you know, it's, it's very different running your own business, being your own boss, like coming up with your own plans and having your own follow through. It's entirely different than like, oh, teacher gives me an assignment. The assignments do this time. If I don't do it, I don't get the grade. It's like all this, there was no external motivation, like no one checking up on me. And so under that pressure of trying to figure out how to build a, you know, coaching business, I could work for like 30 minutes and then I would just like use porn. Cause I was like, oh, I'm too stressed. And I would just like use some porn. And um, then I, all my energy would be sapped. And then I would just play video games for the rest of the day. Yeah. And I'd been doing this for a while. And I was lying to my girlfriend. I was lying to her parents. It's like, oh yeah, you know, business is going super good. <laughs> um, and at like one point my, my girlfriend almost walked in and caught me. And like, I was, it was like, shoot, man. Like if I got caught, she would have probably dumped me. I would have been kicked out. I would have been forced to like slink back home, broke and live in my like parents basement as like this loser, basically. And I was like, man, this something's got to change. And I remember just like falling to my knees and prayer, being like, God, please help me. Please help me. Because I had tried, you know, not just that time back in Lent to quit porn. I had tried multiple times after that, after getting into all the Eastern religion stuff, because they're, you know, a lot of them are really big on the, the semen retention too, like, you know, in, in Taoism and certain parts of Hinduism and stuff like that. I just couldn't do it. Right. And so I just like, man, something's got to change. And I, I started Googling porn addiction. And that's when I discovered NoFap, um, the NoFap subreddit. I discovered Gary Wilson's um, stuff from yourbrainonporn.com, which is still the best uh, scientific website for like the science behind porn addiction. And so, you know, with like, I realized, oh shoot, this thing's addictive. Oh wow, there's thousands, there's hundreds of thousands of other guys struggling with this. Um, like I got the community and I got the scientific framework with that combined with like the self-development background, I was finally able to like quit. Um, but it wasn't pretty. I played a shit ton of video games. Like I would not, coach my I would not coach anyone else to go through their porn recovery in the way that I went through it but I didn't know any better but I got through it and I was like man I, I still need I need to figure out this business thing and now that I was able to finally actually focus on it and do some work I was like man I need a niche well what audience could I serve and I looked around at these guys struggling with porn and they were all operating off of some pretty bad advice there's like crazy dumb advice back then too um and uh I was like you know what I can be that guy. I'll be the porn guy. And I just started making YouTube videos um, about how to quit porn. Um, and I posted them on the subreddit. And this was back before, you know, they had any bans against self-promotion or anything like that. And they took off and my videos started getting good views. And I ended up actually partnering with Alexander Rhodes, the guy who created NoFap. And I became like the head coach of the NoFap Academy and did that for a number of years. And then I spun off and started doing my own thing. And all the while, like working with people individually, running group programs, creating courses, that kind of thing. And so, you know, at this point, I probably practically helped more guys than I think anyone on the planet actually get clean from porn. Um, and so, you know, I'm still doing it today, still helping guys today. I'm expanding into other stuff, but you know, that's, that's still kind of like the, the big stepping stone, the big threshold that a lot of guys have to, to cross. Wow. You're the example, uh, example of, you know, every wound is a womb. Like the very thing that <laughs> is destroying your life is the very thing that you're called to rise through. And so it's pretty amazing right. to see, um, you know, of course, that's a calling for you. It's very evident, you know, you being have helped so many men as a result. Um, but the fact is that there are millions of men who their, their lives are falling apart. I mean, it, the wound is festering and there's salt yeah. being rubbed in it every day and it's becoming uh, infected and it's and, it, and they're dying. And I know this because I speak to men who have consistently destroyed their relationships have destroyed their mm. families. Uh, and it was wild. I had one guy uh, a couple of years ago who he admitted that it ruined his marriage, it ruined his family, uh, but he was he was just not willing to give it up. He was just like, well, you know, it's just, I'm not, I'm not gonna give it up. I'm gonna keep doing it. My question yeah. to you is with how much destruction this causes, both on a, physiological, psychological, and sociological level 
in every way, shape, or form, uh, and, and I think we're just starting to recognize that now, do you imagine that the unleashing of this amount and intensity of pornography is a weapon against men? Hmm. Well, you know, if you're of a spiritual mindset, I, I, like, you know, you believe that Satan exists, I don't know how you could argue the other way, right? And so, you know, I am, I'm, I'm Catholic, and I do believe that there are uh, entities that exist beyond just humanity, and some of them are not good, okay? Some of them are not just, you know, happy little angels of light, and uh, I do believe that pornography is one of their their biggest tools. Now, is does the conspiracy go further than that? Is it like actually people who are like, yeah, we want to ruin and keep men down um, by keeping them hooked on porn? I don't know. But I also do know that there are very evil people out there who want to exert, you know, mass forms of control upon the populace. OK, and if I were them, I'd be using porn <laughs> to like poison right. the, the, the minds of men, because like you think about it, like the biggest threat to the powers that be is a populace of intelligent you know, high will, high competence men. Yeah. Cause that's men are the ones who who tear down empires. They're the ones who who, who remove one ruler and put a new ruler in place. That's right. So it's like if you have if you can keep the the aggressive man sedated and disconnected from what's happening in the world, then you can you can do what you want, right? If you keep the strong man tied up, then the house can get robbed, right? So that's you know, I I believe that's what's happening whether it's intentional or not i don't know but it's for sure what's happening like it okay let me ask you this if there was no guy using pornography how much of the bullshit shenanigans that go on politically do you think would be allowed to continue if guys couldn't just numb themselves out and escape into this fantasy world and they were forced to live in reality yeah it's like an opium Right. It definitely. It's like we're sitting in our own opium dems getting high on porn and therefore the empire is, is crumbling around us and being taken over by, you know, people with nefarious uh, plans. Yeah, I agree with yeah. you 100 percent. It's funny on my way here. I was thinking I'm listening to 33 Strategies of War once again uh, by Robert Greene, mm -hmm. one of the best books ever, especially if you're in business. And um, he was talking about grand plan. Now, this is why I talked about grand strategy. Right. I'm thinking about what is my grand strategy? And, you know, ultimately, you know, whatever it's going to look like, ultimately, this war on vice has to lead somewhere. Imagine a generation of men who stop jerking off, stop smoking weed, get off the alcohol, get off the video games. We're going to look for something to do. We're going to look for a battle to fight. We're going to look for some heads to roll. And I think that my part in this grand plan of making men strong again, which is ultimately to make our culture strong again, is to wake the men up by getting them off of these uh, these habits that blur their vision, dull their senses, and make them weak. Right. These sedatives, right? Mm -hmm. We're such a sedated society. It's insane. It's like not only do we have like the chemical sedation, you know, whatever they put in the food and the water, like all the all that kind of shit, but then also like you have the chemical sedation of like, you know, so many people on antidepressants and all kinds of things right. like that that are changing their 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 minds. And then you've got you throw alcohol, porn, weed, and like video games into the mix. It's like, yeah, no wonder, like no wonder the world's going to shit. Everyone's freaking drunk at the wheel. Right. <laughs> it's just <Yeah>. like <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. And so if it is a weapon, and this is a war, what are our defenses? Hmm. Well, so that's kind of a big question. It's like, <laughs> you, you want to look at it like from a preventative standpoint? Well, you mentioned a, like, a spiritual war. You know, maybe we could, maybe yeah. we could start there. Like, I do believe, I think you're okay. right. Like, Satan is playing his heart cards really strong right now. I saw a meme the other day. That's where I get all my news. I saw a meme the other day uh, that Target now is, uh, has partnered with a, like an openly Satanic. Satanist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw that. Did you see this? And it seems like yeah, every saw, like, company the left and right like, yeah. is like, you know, they're like, they're just... They're killing themselves, but they're just putting their Satan worshiping uh, rainbow cult stuff on on full display. So um, if it is yeah. a spiritual war, like we can go we can go 
from spiritual right down to practical, but let's start where sure. we started. So, uh, what are some tools that men can use in order to fight this enemy where it starts? So in spiritual warfare, I think the most important thing, you know, the key thing that's like at the heart of it all is being able to call the devil the devil, being able to call evil evil and knowing where that line is and how to like articulate it. Like, you know, you think about it in, you know, exorcisms and stuff like that. They always want to get the name of the demon. Mm. Okay. And because when you can name something, you've got power over it, particularly on the spiritual realm, which I believe, like, if you want to think about that in practical terms, the spiritual realm is the realm of meaning. All right. It's the meaning that vibrates through you. That's what I think a spirit really is. It's like meaning in motion uh, throughout the world. And so I think that like, the thing that a lot of guys struggle with is that they think lust is the same thing as sexual attraction when it's not. Lust is sexual attraction that's been hijacked by what, you know, in spiritual terms is a demonic spirit. It's, it's wrapping it up in a lie. And this lie of, oh, like you can consume this. Oh, you need to consume this. Oh, if you don't, if you don't have the, if you don't get this lust satisfied, then that says bad things about you. If you're not, if you're not having enough, if you're not having sex with every beautiful woman that you see, then you need to feel insecure. You need to feel not good enough. You need to feel deprived. Um, it's like there's these lies and you need to be able to ruthlessly cast out those lies. This is like, this is the only, like, on the spiritual plane is like the main place I see actually for a man to wield his most violent tendencies. Because you think about Jesus, all right? You know, as Christians, that's our, our ideal. Where are the, the can you, what are the two places where Jesus was like the most aggressive, like most severe? It was in the temple, right? Cleaning his house, right? Casting out the bullshit. But then also is when he was talking about lust. He says, tear your eye out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that's, that's pretty intense. Yeah. Right. And what he's talking about there is like, you have to be ruthless when it comes to your temple. All right. Particularly when it comes to these things, these spirits that can come in through your eye and you need to have no like qualms about how to handle them. Now, the problem that guys run into with this is that they throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? Because, like I was saying, it's like you have a natural sexual desire, okay? That's not bad. That's actually good. That's beautiful. That's one of the, like, the, the best things that you have in you. You're not supposed to repress your sexuality. You're just supposed to purify it from the wayward forms of uh, expression, really. And so you aggressively purify that you, you, you treat this problem as a demonic invasion that wants to literally choke the value and the fulfillment and the pleasure from your life. You see it as the enemy. You see it as something that will like this evil thing that will come into your life and put its foot right on your throat. OK, like you can't look at it as, oh, it's my old buddy, my old buddy lust. You know, we we had a lot of fun when we were kids. Oh, remember the, the videos we used to watch? It's like so many guys, they're just they're buddy buddy with that energy because it's just been it's been like, you know, jerking off when using porn. It's been like brushing their teeth. Right. They need you need to shift that frame. And when you start shifting that frame and recognizing, hey, sexuality is good, but I want it to be expressed properly in a wholly aligned way this stuff's bad over here. And so when you can do that, I think that's, that's kind of like the, the entry point into to working with the spiritual level of this and fighting it on a spiritual I level. I like that. Name it. That's so important. Yeah. Point it out. I would go so far as to say, like, even give that demon or alter ego, whatever you want to call it, an actual name. That way it's like, it can't hide. It's not a part of right. you. It's not who you are. It is a, it's a disordered entity that wants to control your life. Call it for what it is right. and be mad at it, angry at it for stealing so much from you. Right. And you can feel it. This is the thing that that I'm coming to really understand as I delve deeper into this stuff is that lust, like, like there's like vibrations to things. It's like all right, you have different levels you can process stuff. You can process stuff like on a, uh, like a rational level, right? But you can also process them like on a higher level, like the intuitive level where most of us actually make most of our decisions. Like imagine you take out a, you know, you're at a restaurant, you're trying to decide what you want to eat, 
what you're doing is you're just going through options and you're seeing which one goes ding and which one goes clunk. It's like, oh, that sounds good. Ding, feels good. There's a resonance to it, right? And learning how to key into that resonance, right? Lust has a resonance and hate has a resonance. Uh, avarice has a, has a resonance. All these spiritual things, they have particular signatures that they create in your body. And what you can do is you can become aware of that and be like, oh, that's that's the that's the influence of the spirit. And I'm, I'm not going to entertain that. I'm not going to open the door and let that run through me. I'm not going to give that thing the permission to vibrate through my circuitry. And so when you can take it down to that level and you can start instead channeling your energy into other things, that's incredibly powerful. And so like tools like that to, to help you do that would be things like prayer. You know, I, I pray the rosary every day. Back when I quit porn, I started praying the rosary every day. And so that's that's like my core, like spiritual practice um, and and building a spiritual practice where you learn how to tap into that holy resonance, this, the resonance of the Holy Spirit or of your highest conception of goodness, however you want to frame it, learning how what that feels like versus what the evil spirits feel like that awareness is like where the spiritual battlefield is, is fought. Wow. You know, that makes me think that like many men don't even have a contrast between the two because for you right. know decades they've been enraptured by this one spirit that there's not even like. So, for example, it's like with, a fish in water. What's that? Yeah. Like you're fish in water. Like a um, you know, I, I say this to guys because my experience of getting lost in vice was with weed. And so for five years, you know, between the age of like 36 and 40, 40, 41, uh, I was smoking like almost every day and I literally forgot who I was. It was like, so all that time I, I was a different person. As a result, I didn't know what could possibly be on the other side. Like I didn't, I didn't remember myself and I didn't know what I could be any longer. And so I would only right. imagine that, you know, it's that much more difficult for a guy who's been jerking off for 20 years to really have the uh, have that drawn contrast so that he can latch on to that higher, more holy version of yourself that I hear you saying. So that gives yeah. you more impetus and to want to break gotta, it. Right, right. And it's, it's scary. It feels like, you, you know, when I really was serious about quitting, it felt like I was on the edge of a cliff, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. And all I know is that shit, when I try and give this up, like, I feel horrible. It, and it goes down. It's more than just like the withdrawal feelings. It was like that feeling of like, you know, guys are looking for heaven in in porn. Like Christopher West, I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, yeah, with I had him, him on He's here. Like, okay, nice. Yeah. So like he, he, ha he has a, a quote where it's like, you know, our big problem is that we're looking for the infinite and finite things. We're looking for heaven in something like porn or drugs or whatever. And so it's like when you're giving up that place where you grasp at the infinite, like porn for me, like that's where it was. It was all in sexuality. Like trying to let go of that was like giving up on the idea of heaven. It was like it, it felt like I was throwing myself off a cliff. But and instead of cr like and part of me fell to the rocks below and broke into a million pieces. The bad part but the rest of me is just like i just like stumbled a little bit i'm like oh wait a second this is actually a staircase and i just started moving upward but there's that there needs to be that bravery to cross that threshold to really like do that when you can't see what's on the other side i think that's really important i'm glad you brought that up yeah yeah absolutely so you know that's great i want to go down to something practical but in between and not that that's not practical but you know a lot of guys they want to like what do i do right now sure yeah yeah you mentioned or you quoted Jesus in tearing your eye out. And, and, and that kind of yeah. like woke something up in me when I thought about how he's asking us to go to war on ourselves. Now we have people who, uh, who blame women, right? We have guys who, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I'm kind of like opening it up for you, you know, uh, who say that, you know, women shouldn't be dressing a certain way and they're, th they're kind of thirst traps. Right. They're throwing themselves yeah. around, you know, making it difficult for us. It's having a lack of respect for us. Um, we have Muslims who go so far as, you know, the women cover themselves from head to toe. You know, you can barely just see a, the white of their eyes. Right. And so, you know, maybe they maybe the women do it because out of respect or the men force them to do it. I don't know. But the bottom line is I'm curious what your thoughts are on holding women responsible in this yeah. uh, this whole battle that men are facing. Sure. It's a 
great point. Um, those are though when I do videos on that kind of stuff, uh, they always get the most comments out of any other video I do. I'm just I'm still getting ones from like ones years old because uh, everyone's got a strong opinion on this. Uh, I believe that women should not be dressing in a provocative way uh, because it's not kind. OK, like it's it's not like I don't want to be going to the gym and having teenage girls wear basically painted on like booty shorts and like sports bras. It's just like, I don't want that. Like, I, like men have involuntary reactions to f the female form. And I just don't want that from you. I don't, I don't have that kind of rapport from you with you. You know, it's like, you're not my wife, get out of here. Like go put some clothes on. So it's like from just a, a, a spirit of charity, I believe women should be dressing consciously for like, you know, the people around them. Um, but they don't because they get a, a power trip for it and they're encouraged by society to do it. And they're just as messed up, if not more so than men. So like, you know, I feel for women too. Um, but I don't think we can hold them responsible. Okay. Like that, first of all, like blaming women for our problem is a fundamentally an unmasculine right. thing to do. Okay. Like the way I see it is that every age will ask for some kind of like exceptional thing from men. You know, like back in previous times, like the the demands on the man might have been exceptionally physical, you know, like just braving the elements, going out and hunting, doing like insanely hard physical labor day in and day out to keep your family alive. OK, modern day, we don't have to do that. But guess what? We might have to become exceptional on the sexual front. Mm. OK, like we might have to be able to walk through a society of half clothed or outright naked and twerking women and maintain our sense of sexual self-control, okay? It sounds insane, maybe, but it also sounds insane to like, like freaking live on the frontier. Like I think about them, like, holy smokes, how those people do that? You know, they didn't have any electricity, they didn't have any power, like the men did incredible things. The women did too, but like the men were, you know, they were, whenever something really dangerous happened, they were the ones who had to go do it. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, childcare. childcare obviously was, you know, or childbirth was obviously extremely dangerous too, but that was like a passive, uh, you know, the, the feminine passively faces her challenges. The man actively must face them. And in our age that the exceptional thing that men are called to is a, an extremely high level of, of sexual self mastery, I believe. Mm. Otherwise you are just going to become an agent of the prince of this world, uh, at least to some degree or another. And, uh, I don't think that's good. Wow. Yeah. So you know, on that same front of spiritual battle, which it clear, it's getting clearer and clearer just with the things that you're saying that it is, uh, virtue is our weapon. And my friend Tim Gordon likes to use the phrase, or I've I really adopted it from him because I loved it so much in his book, The Case for Patriarchy, uh, weaponized, weaponized chastity, he says weaponized chastity and you know and that word chastity has been kind of misconstrued to be something that is for women but the way it's he's using it here is as an affront against the ever-present twerks and uh and, and naked booties that we see all over youtube or whatever and so as men like it, rather than having to go out and uh you know kill bears you know like you mentioned or fight a great war we get to pick up our sword of chastity. Yeah, right. that's a powerful way of looking right. at it. I think like with chastity, I feel like it needs kind of like a some PR work. Mm. That's why I don't use the word chastity because it's it's so loaded. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and for so many people, it's just like, ugh, ugh. Like I grew up in Catholic school, we'd have chastity talks and it was just like, eh. I just like did, none of it landed for me. None of it. Did like, you go to connected. chastity balls? Well, we were at our school dances. We were not allowed to like grind or anything like that. Like people still did, but it was always like, you got to leave six inches room for the Holy Spirit. Got to leave room for the yeah. <laughs> it's like, And it's like, you know, as a kid, it seems corny and lame and that sort of thing. And so like, I, that's why I like to fr put it in the, um, in the, the framework of sexual self mastery. Mm -hmm. But really mm -hmm. what it is, is kind of like, um, it's, like I think of it at the highest level, going back to the spiritual level as like a uh, spiritual like dominance, mm. because like really what it is, it's like when lust comes along and you feel that that dirty resonance, you feel it. It's like Ugh. it's it's pulling at you. OK, it's like it's like a dog challenging you. It's like who's going to flinch? 
who's going to turn tail and become bitch. Okay. And like, if you decide to be like, no, I'm in control of this energy, get out. Then there's a polarity shift and you feel it inside your being. But until like, like most guys don't do that. They don't, they, they run from that. They, as soon as that feeling comes, they just like, they just like roll on their back and be like, all right, you're yeah. boss. And it's like, that's, that's what needs to happen is there needs to be that, that, th that's what chastity really is. It's saying I'm control, I'm in control, not you. You know, it's not, and it's not even about the woman, you know, women will do these power plays. That's what dressing provocatively really is. It's a power play. It's like, I'm going to be in control of where your eyes go. And like, it's up to you to one lovingly not let her have that power because it's not hers. She should not be wielding it. And you should be, and you should very lovingly remove that power from her. So it's like, that's, and ironically, that's what women find attractive. That's what a lot of game and pickup stuff is like teaching guys to pretend how to do. It's like, oh yeah, you, you can't like put the pussy on a pedestal, man. It's like, you know, it's like all that kind of stuff, but it's more of like, a lot of times it's just presented as like, just, just pretend it, just make these moves, just act like you're not interested when in reality, you're just like this fiending little goblin on the inside. It's like, no, actually, truly, on the deeper level, do not give her that power. It is not hers. It's irresponsible for you to let her have it. And so if you can, you, when you can, when you start tapping into that, I believe what happens is like there's some kind of serotonin shift and you actually feel more alpha. You feel more confident. You feel more in control. And then women sense it and men sense it. And this is why so many guys, when they quit porn, they get far more success with women and socially with, with guy friends too. Wow. Yep. I've heard that before. On the um, on the topic of women, do, have you noticed? You know, I kind of live in a bubble. You know, I what do they call it? echo chamber? Echo chamber. I'm my own echo chamber, yeah. so I just see what I want to see. Um, algorithm. I could set up my own algorithm in my life. I only want to see certain things. But I think I'm seeing uh, now that men, in a way, are aiming towards a certain excellence that that we really weren't considering even 10, 15 years ago, right? And then a lot of it, you know, has emerged out of the manosphere and red pill stuff and like it's morphing it seems like it's getting a, a bit more mature you know when like you said a lot of that stuff started with pickup understanding intersexual dynamics but now like right. there's the, the patriarch space you know fathers and also it's becoming more christian and so you see like it's sort of moving in the right direction with men still a lot of work to do um but i'm starting to now see women following suit I notice a, mm -hmm. uh, a a revival of the tr the idea of a trad wife. I follow I follow a bunch of mm -hmm. Instagram accounts where like these women, young women, millennial, you know, Gen Z women, are like venerating long dresses and you know and being at home and cooking, <laughs> and you know and, right. and being a trad wife. Or have you noticed that also? It's definitely something that's happening, and I'm like 50 50 on how I feel about it <laughs> because like on one level I think you know. There is like obviously some part of society that's waking up and realizing, wow, we've moved, we've made so much progress, uh, but some of it's leading to some serious stuff. Let's let's turn turn things back a little bit. Let's let's revert to something a little bit more traditional. I think that's for sure happening uh, in some segment of the population. But I also think that in that space people do stuff for clicks, and if they can find a niche, you know, you know, it's like, oh, I got a lot of likes when I characterize myself as a trad girl and like oh this this you know this long dress and this kind of stuff it's got guys slaving over me i mean like, it's the same thing it's just you know as like the the only fans models in some cases it's just that um you know the guys are maybe a little less perverted in the comments but the woman she's still getting the attention and from a hypergamy standpoint they're playing a very similar game um it's different it's better i'd much rather see that i'd much rather see like you know all that kind of thing. But I also think that just the internet perverts these things um, in a lot of ways. So it's like, it's hard, it, it's hard for me to fully wheat and weeds it. But I, I do believe that there will be a continued, like, movement in that direction, like a countercultural movement, I think it'll grow. Um, but I, my worry is that so much of it's backward facing so much. It's just like regressive. It's like, hey, let's go back to traditional, traditional. It's like, yes, but certain things are not changing. Right. Like birth control is not going away. Um, porn is not going away. 
Um, a lot of this stuff like is not going like that, that fundamentally changed the landscape. There needs to be a next level because so much of this stuff now is it's not mandatory. It has to be voluntary. And so like our understandings of this stuff uh, and the ways in which we implement it has to become more sophisticated. It's got it's got to evolve. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you fully. I'm happy that you said that because uh, the fact is that if you're not Christian and Catholic, you're not traditional. Right. Because the fall of the West came with the breakdown of Christendom. So if you're talking, you know, being a trad, well, you're playing make believe trad. That's like having uh, Christianity without Jesus or, you know, like having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but hold the peanut butter and jelly. Just give me the bread. It's not built on anything. It's not built on anything. So the fact is that it will have to go right back to the roots of what built our civilization. Doesn't matter how many long dresses or, um, you know, cupcakes you cook <laughs> like if, if there's yeah. no uh th there isn't that um that foundation that spiritual foundation then it's all you know, it's all make-believe it's all games i agree with you fully yeah yeah it's it's uh it's weird the way that the internet just changes everything and inc incentivizes weird stuff and some of it's good and some of it's bad half the time i just like don't even know if influencers like really believe what they say or if they're just saying something for clicks and it's just uh it gets weird to try and like navigate that space today well you know do you think that women will ultimately well i believe so but i want to know where you go they will just mirror men's behavior like wherever men are going women are going to counter it and mirror us like the whole sexual revolution thing is a byproduct of chastity being unleashed and men getting free sex uh if men start taking uh, taking action and moving towards what's righteous and good women are just going to in order to to even be worthy of themselves because without a man's attention it's uh, that's a woman's currency um they'll they won't be of any value and so like a high value woman i'm going on a little rant here but like a high value woman is a woman who mirrors high value in men or any value in men. I don't even have to be high value. If a man, if men have shitty values, women are just going to marry that, mirror that. If men have good values, do you think that women will just naturally follow suit? I don't think it's going to be that simple because like the way that the, the dating market, like the, the sexual marketplace seems to work right now is that you got the, the high value according to the world standard man at the top and he's having sex with all the women and so just because the like like the guys who aren't at that pinnacle because typically it's not the guys who are having all the sex that are making this like traditional movement um and so it's like just because they decide to change does that mean that women who are chasing those you know high value men or whatever um will they follow i think eventually uh there will be some shift like that there we're, we're i mean we're gonna see in the next 10 years we're gonna see a crisis hit women mm -hmm. um as a huge chunk of the population passes childbearing years unable to have right. kids okay and that's that's going to cause all kinds of ripples i can't even you know fully right. comprehend uh, but that's going to be a big yeah, deal. The left so overs. that'll change the sexual marketplace too. But it's like, the thing is like what the world defines as a high value man. Like right now it's like Andrew Tate, as much as the mainstream hates him, he's what they've created. Like that's like, they've just, they said the guy who's, you know, rich, who's kind of a, you know, uh, an aggressive asshole um, and sleeps with a lot of women. He's cool. We you spent years basically building up that image, and all of a sudden you've got one, and he says "f you" to the system, and they hate him, and all these kids, all these young men, look up to him as like that's what it means to be high value. And don't get me wrong, there are some elements of what he does that I, I like, but there's also a lot that I really don't like, like at all. And so, it's it's the way that we define masculinity for men as a whole and sell it to the society. I think that's the only thing that really changes stuff. There needs to be Andrew Tate level guys, but with, you know, I would say Christian morals. Like there needs to be, you know, for lack of a better term, there needs to be like, you know, modern saints 
who are willing to stand for something that's truly good, holistically good, head to toe, you know, um, beginning to end. And they need to be able to also communicate that and, and, and sell it in a way that at least a segment of society can latch on to. So I don't think we found that guy yet, but uh, I hope we get there because that's that's what we need. We kind of need a we need like the, this this kind of stuff we're talking about sexuality wise. We need a Trump. We need an Andrew Tate. We need someone where it's like we can like that that a cultural movement can be built behind. I like it. I see it happening. We'll, we'll see that in our lifetime. I think so. Yeah, I think we're gonna so. see that here pretty soon. I think, I think. I have a good feeling. Okay, cool. So. Young man, so listening to what we're saying, he agrees. He says it's a good idea, but I got this raging boner. Ooh, what do I do? I don't know what to do. How do, how does he take control? How does he have mastery over that in the heat of the moment? What do I do? Sure. What do I do? Well, so there's uh, there's two different kinds of things here. All right, one is the the actual raging boner. Okay, so it's like a, a true authentic sex drive. All right. That's pretty easy to fix. Go do some shit, right? The, the classic advice actually applies to this. It's like, go work out, go run, go study, go do some work, okay? Because like I said before, sexual energy is very easily transmuted into like, you know, status acquisition, okay? Problem is that's not what most guys are struggling with um, today. What they're struggling with is something different. They're struggling with a deeper emotion, usually some kind of insecurity, some kind of stress, Maybe um, financial insecurity, uh, sexual insecurity, um, you know, loneliness, uh, guilt, whatever it is. They have some kind of negative emotion that they've trained themselves to medicate through pornography and masturbation. You know, that's become the, the shut off button. And so if you do that enough, like, you know, if you jerk off every time you're stressed, eventually you stop even noticing you're stressed. You just think you're horny. You're not. You're, you're stressed. And if you, and even if you go work out, that stress didn't, you didn't solve that stress. So the craving is going to come right back. These kind of cravings don't go away. Authentic sexual cravings, they come and go like a little wave. It's like, you know, 15 minutes later, you're fine. Like the boner is not going to stick around. Okay. If you're, you're getting up and you're, you're putting yourself into doing something, but these kinds of things will keep coming back. And so what you have to do with these, you have to figure out, all right, what the heck's underneath this? What is the negative emotion? What's the thing going on in my life that's got me a little upset? And then you got to solve that or at least create a plan to start solving it. And that's going to be scary because that's going to require you to actually like look at your life and take responsibility for it. But as you start doing that, that's what really solves this thing. And so like when I help guys really quit porn, it's it's on both of these fronts. It's like practically, all right, where do you direct your energy? But then also, how are we solve? Like what kind of problems are you facing and how can we deal with those? You know, like what's what's going to really move you forward in life? So it's like this this dual approach. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, we're going towards it as a means by which you numb yourself or try to avoid what needs to be dealt with. And I could just imagine, you know, if it's, if it's anything like weed addiction where, you know, it's, it's a matter of having what I would just plainly say, a sense of boredom that arises hmm. when you should be facing something that you don't want to face or do something that you really don't want to do, but you know you need to do it. Most guys who fall into vice, rather than it being, at least on the surface, something traumatic that you're trying to overcome, right? It's, can you just sit in the tension? Sit in the tension of the boredom so that you can uncover that which you're not trying to see. Right, yes, there's a tension there for sure. It's like, cause it's not immediately obvious. Like once you start doing this work, it's like, you gotta create, like if I get like a, you know, some kind of craving like that. I'm like, I can immediately tell, oh, I'm, I'm worried about this or I'm stressed about this. But it's like, until you build that kind of internal like self-knowledge, yeah, it's going to be kind of like this state of like, oh, this doesn't feel good. What is this? And it's like, oh, it's my <laughs> my negative emer- emotion coming to the surface. And you, you kind of can like, you can talk to it. You can be like, yo, what's going on with you? What do you want? That's the big thing you want to come back to is like, what do you want? Because you can ask yourself a million different questions. You can go back to your past. You can relive your traumas. You can do all this kind of shit. But like the only thing that really moves you forward is you say to that part that's in pain, say, what do you want right now? 
And once you can figure out what it wants, or at least an idea of what it wants, then you can start making a plan and doing something about it. And that's what men need. They need a plan. They need action. They need solutions. You know, go into problem solving mode, but you know, face that discomfort long enough to figure out what the heck's going on inside. Yeah, I love it. And I think NLP, they say you're either running away from something or running towards. I think maybe what I hear yeah. you saying is, you know, sure, you can run away, right? Get up and go do something. But what are you running towards? What do you really want? Where are you going in life? That's going to compel you or impel you forward, man. A hundred percent. Like if you, one of the things I say to guys, like after I get them clean, like they go like 90 days or whatever, I say, hey, you can't stop here. You have to keep going forward. You have to pick the next goal. You have to pick the next main objective. And you have to use all the systems we use to got you, get you clean. We use those now to conquer this goal, to go after this one. Because if you're not moving forward, you will be moving backward. And so, you know, it sounds exhausting, but that's that's coming from this mentality of someone who's got a jacked up motivational system. Once your motivational system's fixed, moving forward's exciting. You're on fire. It's like you're living the adventure of your life. And so, you know, I'm just pleading with you guys. Take the plunge, you know, you know. What do you have to really lose? Like you could gain so much from from embarking on this journey. Mark, this has been awesome, dude. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, where can people learn more about your YouTube channel, your website, all the cool stuff that you're doing, dude? Yeah, best thing to do is uh, go to my YouTube channel. Just uh, look up Mark Quepit uh in the in there and you know if you like what you see then you know i would recommend that you join my newsletter i send out a an email every uh monday through friday and uh a lot of guys really seem to like that so um yeah that's the best place and uh, i'm gonna be having some new stuff rolling out here soon that i'm really excited about so uh, hopefully uh if you like what i said here please follow along. cool awesome yep go ahead and do that fellas mark thank you dude and for the rest of you until next time done if you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.